This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TVMALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Hello, and welcome to Scare You to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Scott. I hope you're having a good day, and if not, then I hope I can make it just a little bit better. Thank you for being here with me. I love the company. If you follow me on Twitter, you saw that I had some audio issues in that both my sets of earbuds decided to die on me. Luckily, one of them only half died, but I still had to record this with only one ear and edit, so that means, unfortunately, there are no cool binaural tricks this week. Uh, I hope it sounds okay, and if not, then just let me know, and I'll try to fix it this weekend if the levels are off when I get my new earbuds. You probably also noticed that the kids' episode came out. I hope you and any little ones in your life enjoyed it. I would love to do another one, so feel free to send me your kids' stories. I'll just compile them like I do the true stories until I get enough for a full episode. And remember, it's scary to sleep at gmail.com. Let's start things off this week with a story I've been sitting on for quite a while. The author, Jeff Hamill, sent this to me back in December, and it got buried in my email. It was such a nice surprise to find. This one is sure to give you nightmares. Here is Not This Time. When I was a boy, I had very intense nightmares, like being chased through the ocean's depths by a ghost wreck of a ship crewed by skeletal pirates, or walking through the fog past rows of severed heads mounted on spikes. Lots of blood. The adults all said it was general anxiety and too much television. There were the creatures that chased me. Some of them looked nearly human they were not. Some of them wore our clothing, but were shades of darkness they tried to mold when they saw me. I've done some research on them. Nearly every culture has some sort of astral predator. Not quite ghosts or demons. Phantasms, perhaps. They would chase me, my heart pounding. But I could always wake up by blinking my eyes. Just blink enough, and I would wake up heart pounding, covered with sweat, but I had escaped, at least for the night. But there was one dream from which I never really recovered. I was dreaming, and one of them was chasing me through my mind's labyrinth. I saw my house and ran to it. The door was open. I made the last desperate sprint and slammed the door shut. But the creature's hand almost human, but sallow and nails sharp like claws, thrust through the opening just before it shut. It seemed unhurt. Without a pause, it pried the door open. I stumbled back in fright, tears welling from the large, quote-unquote, man. The thing in a coat that appeared like a facade of flesh, sewn onto a well of darkness, that strode into the unlit hallway. I blinked my eyes, kept blinking them. Sometimes it took longer than others, but it always worked. Why was I still here? I blinked harder, faster. I knew it was a dream. Just a nightmare, not real. I tried to move my body, my real one that was asleep. He came towards me, not hiding the menace on his face. Blinking. Come on. He leaned over my supine form and pulled out a blade, twisted like a hook, but with a sharply glinting edge. Not this time, he said, and slid the knife across my throat. They say you can't die in a dream, 
that you'll wake up first, or perhaps if you die in the dream, you die for real, and no one ever wakes to tell. The blood poured from my neck, covering everything with warm, bright red. He laughed like a shadow, licked the blade, and turned and left. Maybe he just vanished, I can't remember. I gasped and gurgled, convulsed as the warm became cold. And then everything became cold and dark. I died in that nightmare, whatever they say. I woke. I was in my bed. My mom and dad were in the room. Are you okay? said my mom. You were having a nightmare. I was about to tell them about it, but was scared of my own words. When the creature came into my room, before I knew what was happening, he brandished the hook knife and cut my mom's throat. The scream and gurgling was terrible. I think I started screaming, but I couldn't hear anything. My father lunged at the tall man, but the creature grabbed his arm. He twisted it, and I saw my dad writhe in pain just before the creature sliced into his neck, showering me with blood. I was crying. It all happened so fast. He stood over me with his crooked grin. I awoke again. It was dark. I couldn't move. I was covered in cold sweat. The shadow creature was on the ceiling, the coat hanging in the air, draping around his face. It was less human than before, an amorphic glob made of the stuff of nightmares. The creature leaned down to me, its arms and legs still gripping the ceiling like an insect, stretching with a hellish, cracking noise. I remember seeing eyes and a mouth, more of a dark maw, but the rest was a blur seeming of flesh stitched over some inky nothingness. He put a long, bony finger in front of his mouth as if to say, This is your secret. He crawled on the ceiling out the door and disappeared down the dark corridor. I couldn't move. I tried to move anything. A hand, a foot, my neck. But nothing happened. I could feel my own breath. I was afraid that I would stop breathing, even more than I feared the creature, so I counted my breaths. I must have drifted off, but I don't remember anything more than staring at the ceiling, counting my breaths, fearing they would stop or that the creature would return. Was it in my parents' room, murdering them, or worse? I don't remember waking up. It was a long time ago, so maybe I did back then. I like to think that I used to remember. I do remember eating breakfast. Mom and Dad were there. They were cheerful. I don't know if they noticed that I was quiet. I didn't tell them anything. It was too horrible. At first, their disposition comforted me. But then... And I don't know how the thought entered my head, but it seemed like they were different somehow. Like their skin was sewn over some simulacrum and that my parents were gone. To this day, lying in an empty room and sleep eluding me, a part of me still wonders whether I'm awake or still trapped in that nightmare. I blink my eyes, but nothing happens. 
maybe I am still there. In the world I look upon as peopled only with the empty creatures. The phantoms that lurk just beneath our world in the land of Nod. If so, my tale may reach no one. But if you are hearing this story, then maybe, someday, you will see them too. And the curse will pass from me. I'm going to admit one of my guilty pleasures to you guys. I love those disgusting pimple popping videos. I've loved them for years. Give me a dilated pour of whiner and I am a happy girl. Well, when I read this story by Al Bruno III, aka the Night Blogger, I think I actually squealed with joy. Go check out his awesome podcast, by the way. If you like mine, you'll definitely like his. I'll leave a link in the show notes to the Night Blogger. Anyway, I present to you Ethel's Addiction. I didn't meet Ethel until after the events I'm going to talk about here. And no, her name isn't really Ethel. Thing is, I know she'll never read this, but it would be a sin to let her real name get out there. She's not a freak, and Lord knows she's suffered enough. I want however many days she has left to be peaceful ones. But I can't not share her story. It haunts me. No one ever intends to become an addict, but all it takes is that first sip of wine at dinner or a sampling of an illicit pharmaceutical at a party for an unlucky individual to start down a path of self-destruction. Drugs and alcohol aren't the only thing that can prey on the weak-willed or unlucky. Shopping, food, and gambling have all made people miserable at one time or another. Whole industries have sprung up to help men and women from all walks of life to take back control of their lives. But Ethel's addiction was an unusual one. There were no recognized treatments or easy explanations. Ethel, you see, was addicted to popping pimples. It began with a YouTube video that her friends shared amongst themselves, a woman with a cyst on her back the size of an apple. It was the kind of video that was sent with the header of can you watch all the way through or super gross out. The woman in the video, Ethel never saw her face or heard her name, was in what looked like a doctor's office. Hands in latex gloves covered the oversized blemish with an antiseptic and made sure plenty of gauze was nearby. Then, a sharp scalpel came into view. It cut the skin and white-yellow fluid all but burst from the wound. It went everywhere, some even landing on the camera filming the event. The person using the scalpel kept working, rolling the tip of the instrument around, coaxing more and more of the noxious-looking fluid out, until all that flowed from the wound was blood. Ethel was riveted. She watched the video dozens of times. That YouTube video led to others, link after link of squeezing fingers and lancing instruments. The videos led her to reddits and forums, to exclusive Facebook and Pinterest pages. Watching kept her up late at night. Sometimes she never went to bed at all. She remembered being a teenager, the occasional breakouts, and her mother cautioning her not to pick at her face. Compared to the other girls, she had been lucky. There were some that had hidden their faces behind the books they were carrying, who had endured insults like pizza face and worse. Everyone said Ethel was one of the prettiest girls in class. But she was 30 years old now, bored with work and marriage. The next time Ethel got a blemish, it was on her shoulder. She stared at it a long time, 
She had drawers of special skincare products for this kind of thing. But she decided that this time, she would take matters into her own hands. Pop. It took barely any pressure at all. Certainly less than she expected, and it was so much better experienced than watched. The discomfort, the sudden pressure, the release, and the lingering soreness. On some level, she couldn't understand she both heard and felt the blemish give way. Then, Ethel took to giving her husband Floyd back rubs. He certainly didn't protest. That hour or so was probably the most time they'd spent together in months. His law practice kept him busy, maddeningly so at times. When she found some ingrown hair or neglected pustule, he would ask her not to pick at it and she wouldn't listen. She was relentless. It didn't matter how much he squealed or if she drew blood. To keep him from shying away, she made sure that her grooming sessions ended with sexual intercourse. To Ethel, it was a perfectly mature understanding. Floyd got what he wanted, and she got what she wanted. It went on like that for a time. Ethel stating herself with videos until a bump or blackhead appeared on herself or her husband. Those were moments she savored like fine wine. She probably could have gone on like that for the rest of her life, but Floyd had other ideas. One night at dinner, he told her that he was in love with a co-worker, and he was leaving. Ethel had wondered why he'd pulled the old suitcase out of the attic days earlier, but never thought to ask. She'd never suspected she needed to. Soon enough, she was living alone for the first time in her life. Alone and inconsolable. She had friends and family close by, but it wasn't enough. She had a busy work schedule, and that wasn't enough. Finishing off one bottle of Chablis a week wasn't enough. Even the pimple-popping videos weren't enough. So, Ethel changed her diet, eating more and more fast food, more and more chocolate. She read articles with skincare advice and did the opposite of the recommendations. Then, she waited. The first few blemishes were small, little pinpricks of red that almost looked like freckles. Ethel worked at them eagerly, having grown her nails out and bought a new makeup mirror for just this occasion. Pop. Tiny, but exhilarating. The discharge they expelled was thick and solid. She could roll it around on her fingertips. Pop. When the next few pimples began to show, she let them be. Let them fatten up. Whiteheads grew, blackheads darkened. The whiteheads almost always went painlessly but spectacularly, marking the surface of her mirror with speckles of yellow, white, and green. Sometimes she would keep the pressure on until she added a spattering of red to the mix. The blackheads could be more challenging sometimes resisting her attention for hours at a time until they were nothing so much as swollen nubs of pain that felt far larger than they actually were. When the surface of one finally broke, it would exude a thin streamer of pus. She would watch in fascination as the little filament of exudate twisted along her finger, then squeeze harder and harder until something would give way and a rivulet of blood veined with yellow and white shot from the wound. As many Scary to Sleep fans know, I've been going through a lot of changes in my life, and one thing I've been doing is getting my finances much more organized, and that includes paring down some of the subscriptions I pay for. It feels like everything is a subscription these days, be it for the gym or streaming services or music, the list goes on and on, and something that has helped me tremendously is Rocket Money. 
they not only helped me cancel subscriptions that were a pain to try to do myself. Have you ever tried to deal with some of these companies directly? It's just a headache. Rocket Money also alerts me when the subscriptions I did keep go up in price, giving me the ability to weigh my options and keep those little extras that add up oh so quickly in check. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. I can see all of my subscriptions in one place, and if I see something I don't want, I can cancel it with a tap. I never have to get on the phone with customer service. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. That's rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. She would celebrate each of her victories of those blemishes with a glass of wine and a dab of sea breeze. Pop. Left cheek, then right cheek. Forehead, then chin. She would let one part of her face fester and work at another. She learned how to cultivate razor bumps when she shaved her legs and was amazed at how resistant they could be, but made them give up their secrets. All it took was a sewing needle and persistence. Occasionally, she filmed herself, but it was never the same on playback, no matter how close she got to the camera. And Ethel never, ever considered posting them. This was for her and her alone. She could imagine no experience more intimate. Late at night, when she was lying in bed, half drunk with her face and legs, stinging with astringent, she would wonder how much she had drained from her body this way. Drop by drop, spurt by spurt, a pint, maybe a gallon. She tried to imagine it, an empty carton or milk jug overflowing with thick, putrefying liquid. She thought of the skin cells she shed every day and the mucus that gathered in her nose, of the mites that lived on her eyelashes and the bacteria that made their homes in her gut. In the end, was that all a person was? A festering wound? A host for infections? Ethel's friends and relatives would try to broach the subject of her complexion with her. Never directly, though. They would ask if she was sick, if she had seen a doctor, or what beauty products she was using. She would wave such concerns away and change the subject. What did they know about her and her interests? As she drifted from one party or family reunion to another, she would see more and more pitying gazes thrown her way. Ethel accepted them with a grim amusement. Sometimes she would see people staring at a particularly swollen blackhead or purposely neglected twin-headed pimple and see a flash of something familiar in their eyes. They wanted to get their fingers on those blemishes as much as she did, to feel the lump skin protest against the squeezing and then give way. She was never uncomfortable with these people. Let them stare. Let them be jealous. Other times, she would see nothing but pure disgust in someone's expression. Someone with perfect skin and hair that judged her and saw her as somehow inferior. With those people, Ethel wanted nothing more than to give a demonstration of her newly developed skills. To send an arc of pus sailing into their face with a single, simple gesture. But she never did that. It would be a waste. Pop. Then, 
she had the accident. It was a stupid thing, really. Ethel had been driving back from the store when she'd become distracted by a previously unnoticed ingrown hair lurking just behind her earlobe. She knew better than to text and drive, or call and drive. She wasn't even one to fiddle with the radio while in traffic, but her attention kept returning to the blemish. One hand on the wheel, she tried to get it to go by pinching it between the fingers of her free hand. No luck. It was maddeningly resistant. So finally, she gave in to temptation and used both hands to push at the ingrown hair. The pimple plopped open just as she clipped the front fender of the Nissan running the yellow light ahead of her. She wasn't in the wrong, that was obvious, but the officers on the scene insisted on breathalyzer tests all around. They found Ethel's blood alcohol level to be within the legal limit, but just barely. It was all so embarrassing, and the Nissan's driver only made things worse by suing anyone and everyone possible. They told a story that painted them as a victim of irresponsible drivers, poorly designed intersections, and soft tissue damage. Ethel was surprised when she saw her ex-husband Floyd among the attorneys involved in the deposition. She was even more surprised when he didn't recognize her. When she finally approached him after the proceedings, all his well-trained lawyerly dispassion was gone in an instant. When he spoke, his voice was loud enough that everyone in the room heard. What the hell happened to you? Those words followed Ethel home from the courthouse. Every time she glimpsed herself in the rearview mirror, a reflective surface, she heard it again. What the hell happened to you? When she got home, she cursed that there was no alcohol in the house, but she had told herself she needed to cut down. The accident had been a close call, and she had been frightened to realize later that she didn't know how long it had been before her last drink and hitting the road that night. But she would have loved a drink right then. She wanted her mind to be empty and spinning. She wanted her vision and senses blurred. Once, not too long ago, he had looked upon her face with adoration. Then, later on, resignation. In time, Ethel had become used to both, but the expression of horror on his face, it had been too much to bear. She cleaned off her makeup mirror and looked at herself. Not the blemishes old and new, not the oily patches and deep, bruised-looking pockmarks. Ethel saw herself, saw the extent of her self-mutilation. Why had she done this? Why had she become so obsessed with the act of whittling away at herself to the point that she had become unrecognizable to the man that shared her bed for nine years? Remembering the tiny blooms of pleasure she had taken in the act suddenly left her feeling sick to her stomach. Ethel ran her hands over her cheeks. They were ragged and eaten away. Her forehead was a ruin of interconnected scars, and her chin was a festering wound of pustules half gone to becoming cysts. Someday, long from that moment, she would come to learn the terms body-focused repetitive behavior and exoriation disorder. But that night, the night she wailed with self-disgust and self-realization and smashed her mirror, Ethel only knew this was more than she could take. And after all, what was one more mutilation at this point? She hooked each of her hands into claws and brought them forward. And after a deep breath to steal her courage, drove them deep into her eye sockets with all her might. Then she pinched.
Our last segment tonight is by Reddit user Terrifying Tales. I'll leave a link to their Reddit page as they've got so many great stories to read, you've really got to check it out. This one is a poem of sorts, and I sure hope you don't have arachnophobia. This is Sleepaway Therapy. My name is Sally Evernor. My house is 104. I was afraid of spiders, though I'm not scared anymore. My mommy didn't like me. My daddy didn't care. They told me there's no spiders. I knew that they were there. They came to me in darkest night. They climbed upon my hair. They climbed to my silken sheets and made their home right there. I screamed about the spiders. I tried to make them care. The spiders, though, were clever. They knew when they were there. They scurried along, left and right. They scrambled out of sight. My parents never believed me. For a moment, I thought they were right. They took me to a therapist. She seemed so very nice. She told us of a sleepaway camp. That would be just right. They glanced at one another, then they glanced at me. You're going to this camp for care and therapy this week. I begged and pleaded not to go. I put up a good fight, but in the end they dropped me off and soon were out of sight. I stood at the entrance to the camp, then cabin number four, being ushered through the entryway by Camp Counselor 624. The room was very quiet, except for one weird sound the pitter-patter of tiny feet echoing across the ground. I heard a sound behind me. 624 locked the door. I was trapped inside this cabin that was labeled number four. That is when I saw him, a shadow of a boy. That's when I noticed his strange legs, all eight upon the floor. He crept his way right towards me, the light swinging back and forth. No longer was he human. He was a spider mutant boy, His limbs were broken and disfigured. The joints were out of place. The skin on each leg didn't match the color to his face. Beside his mouth were mandibles formed from fingers and two knives. They occasionally clanged together, a horrific, ghastly sight. His upper body was his own. His lower one was not. Protruding like a thorax, an ungodly fright, his toenails sharp as razor blades, his eight eyes gleaming bright. He had spun a web inside the room that clearly marked his side. For weeks, I was inside that room. For weeks, I was filled with dread. But during that time, I escaped the fate that happened to my friend. He spoke to me so softly. He told me I was safe. As long as I obeyed their rules... I wouldn't end up this way. He too was afraid of spiders. He had disobeyed. He had been resistant, so they made him see their way. They hired up a surgeon. They hatched a horrid plan. The next thing they got rid of was Tyler's mom and dad. He wept and cried in fear, his pleas falling on deaf ears. Soon he wound up in his tomb, a body filled with gloom, cocooned in his new body, that would never be his own. He found a new respect for spiders, one not previously known. I too began to have respect. Five weeks and I was cured, sent home three weeks early to my parents' warm abode. My parents began to love me, no longer like before, as I had told them all about cabin number four. I wondered what happened to Tyler, the boy in cabin four, My friend who'd helped me oh so much, though I could not help him more. Mom and Dad won't tell me, but I overheard a call. Tyler is in a better place. He's right here at my door. He died that night in cabin four when the police arrived. His spirit left his body, found another host to thrive. A spider in my room. He sleeps upon my bed. I understand him clearly in his spider dialect. I'm not afraid of spiders. No, not anymore. My name is Sally Evernor. I live in House 104. Mommy and Daddy love me. 
I have more friends than before. I can talk to spiders, thanks to cabin number four. The human race will suffer. The human race will pay. If you've ever killed a spider, we are on our way. Accident or not, it matters not to me. Everyone will suffer. Humans are so weak. We're coming for you at this moment. We're at your bedroom door. Hello, my name is Sally, and I'm knocking on your door. Thanks for listening. Remember to check out the author's links in the show notes and show them some love. Also, just a reminder to rate and review this show on iTunes. It really helps out the show, especially for little guys like me. Speaking of support, this week's Patreon patrons are Julie DePrada Schott and Chrislyn Perkins. Take a moment to absorb the big hug I'm sending you both over the airwaves. Oh, and the random weird soothing sound of the week is hairbrushing. Thank you, Philip, for going to scarytosleep.com and requesting that. I also got to just chill and brush my hair in silence for a while, which was super relaxing. So thank you for that. You can also do the same thing and request whatever sound, weird or not, that you find soothing that you want played at the end of the show to help you drift off to sleep. Send me your stories at scarytosleep at gmail.com. Follow the show on Instagram and Twitter at scarytosleep. You can follow my personal page at Shelby B. Scott. Join the Facebook group, facebook.com slash group slash Gary to sleep to participate in the discussion threads each week for each episode. I think that's it. Now go get some sleep. Sweet dreams.